Hello Watch Enthusiasts! Now today I have a video which a few people asked for a few weeks ago, and which I'm pleased to be able to deliver. Because this is a collection review for 2019, because I produced a review of this nature about a year ago now, and a few things have changed within my collection. A few pieces are on the way out, and there have been some additions to the, the collection as well, which I think are of interest. And, and I think adds to a, a developing collection in terms of, of having more of a theme, and also I think becoming a more of a historically interesting collection, whether that's history in terms of the, the history of the watch industry as a whole, or, or in terms of particular endeavours which I find of interest. But of course all of that later. And before I begin the video I would of course like to encourage you to like, share and subscribe if you enjoy this video and, and find its content uh, interesting or, or useful. Also, do follow me on Instagram at the address which is now on the screen to be able to see more content which you wouldn't be able to access on the channel, whether I buy a watch, uh, go to an event, or anything else of that nature, you'll see that on my Instagram instead. And so here is the collection, with everything ranging from my dress watches on this side, through some chronographs in the centre, to the sports and dive watches in this, uh, this area of the, the shot. And so I'll talk you through them, starting with the sports watches and then running through to the dress watches. And certainly all of these watches have played a, a role in my collecting, and, and I think it's about time I, I reviewed this, uh, this concept of doing a, a collection review, which I think is an interesting one, just to give an idea of uh, where I'm coming from in terms of, of an owner of watches. And so really to start, I think it would be nice to talk about this glycine. Now, it's a 1970s glycine, is, uh, is a vintage piece with certainly no water resistance now, without a full service and probably a new crown. But it's a piece which I've enjoyed owning for, for quite a few months now, um, well over a year, in fact, at this stage. And it's a model which comes in stainless steel, of course, and I haven't seen another like it with a dial in this condition. Now, as you can see, the dial has faded. It's uh, developed a sort of a, a grey hue to it, as well as the fact that the markers which were applied have, have, uh, have oxidised over time, as well as the tritium which was originally on the dial, which you, you can actually see with tritium through the, the use of the, the Swiss um, made with a T on either side at the bottom of the dial and that has, has aged, as has the tritium on the hands, which means the watch doesn't glow anymore, but certainly with a half-life of um, about 13 years, it's not surprising that it wouldn't glow at this stage. Now the dial itself has the, the old glycine logo, as you can see, with that crown over the top, which I think is rather attractive, and glycine have started to roll back out on, uh, on notably a vintage piece, which is uh, soon to be on the market, um, at least as is, uh, is corresponding to their Instagram posts recently. And this is a watch with the date, of course, and it's a small piece too, bearing in mind it, that it is, a, it is a lugless design. This watch is only 38mm and is roughly square, with these rather appealing bevels running along the edge of the case, which I think give a, a whole different dimension to this case. I love the crystal as well, which, uh, as per the, the period, has this box shape to it in acrylic, which means that it rises high above the bezel, and with a bidirectional bezel which isn't luminous, this was never conceived to be a, a deep-sea diver, but simply an interesting skin diver with 200 metres of water resistance. And inside this watch is a 2700 line of, of ETA movement, which really can be viewed as the predecessor to the modern ETA2824s, and featured automatic winding, uh, roughly the same 38 hour power reserve, but ran to slower beat rate of uh, 21,600 vibrations per hour, so like for example a Seiko movement uh, would usually run at, with 6 ticks per second, and also isn't hacking but does retain hand winding and a quick set date. And it's a piece which I always enjoy wearing to really put me in mind of, of more simple watches, and pieces which ne aren't necessarily particularly rare or particularly valuable, but are nicely made and are, are really a pleasure to see on the wrist. And turning the watch over, of course, no exhibition case backs here, just a solid steel case back uh, denoting the water resistance and the serial number. And it's a piece which is very simple in its build, but, but always appeals to me as this, this glimpse into the past, uh, and is a well-maintained example as well, with a movement which appears to be running very well and certainly has been serviced recently, so should be able to continue long into the future. So a real pleasure to own. Now the next piece to speak about is a Zodiac, and this is a recent addition to the collection. And this is a Zodiac Super Seawolf 53. And it's a model which is, uh, is a piece which has been in the Zodiac collection for a fair few years now, but has been updated regularly. And with this model there's an incredibly bright um, colourway, if you see what I mean with this, this watermelon um, sort of Audunil colour bezel as well as these, um, the, these orangey-pink areas within the dial. And it certainly is an acquired taste. There are certainly more, more, uh, more subdued versions of this watch available, but I think this one is a very bright and interesting alternative to other dive watches which I own. So, for example, my Omega Seamaster 300, which is, is far more sober than this timepiece, and in many ways this is a more fun watch when you just want to enjoy something which is water-resistant to, to as far as you would ever need it to be, 
with uh, an appealing uh, unidirectional bezel, and also a movement which is quite excellent. Because this watch is a stainless steel piece with brushed and polished finishes, um, and uh, if I just manage to get them to focus, my camera appears to be struggling with this, um, this depth of field, but I'll, uh, I'll work with it. But the stainless steel case is polished and, and brushed in a very attractive manner, as you can see on the sides, and doesn't feature an exhibition case back, but in, instead features this rather interesting embossed 200 meter water resistant uh, closed case back, which fits with the vintage style of this watch, which does appear to be something from the 60s. And this is directly based on models of the Super Seawolf from the 60s, after its original steel bezeled version was released in the 50s. And certainly with this design you get a fantastic uh, quality, because the, the dial has this, this wonderful sunburst effect to it. But also you do notice this watch compared to other ones, that the hands are very, very sharply cut. As you can see the edges are, are perfectly sharp, with none of the softness which one sometimes does see in watches at every price range. The hands are also attractively painted, and, and with a 200 meter water resistance it's all I'd want in a dive watch. But the interesting part of this watch, aside from the dial which I think look, does look great, and the bezel which with 120 clicks is a, a very sharp contender for a, a very good quality bezel for this sort of price range, the movement is a, a movement which is a, a sort of mix, if you will, a hybrid between in-house and, uh, and a sort of stock movement. Because it's the STP3-13, which is a movement which has been, has been uh, used by a number of Zodiac, Zodiac products, and it is, it's essentially the Fossil Group's own manufacturer of movements, which has produced a movement which is based on the same architecture as an ETA2824, and has the same number of jewels at 25, with the same specs, largely hacking and hand-winding and running at 4 hertz. But the difference is that this is fully finished um, to a, a very high standard, with, with decoration all through it, and also they only come in a chronometer standard of movement. Now, not all are actually rated, but they all come with that standard of movement, which I think is... is is very appealing and something which isn't particularly well advertised by Zodiac, but is true, and they do also have, have swan neck regulators to them, just adding to the appeal of this watch. And so as a fun piece with a sapphire crystal, a 200 meter water resistance, and also this rather fun bracelet, which um, is all solid, but also has these narrow links, which are much more like a vintage bracelet, in the sense that they're very fluid um, throughout their whole shape and articulation. It's a watch which I've enjoyed wearing a great deal, and, and is always a fun wear, watch to wear if I don't feel like having a more serious piece on. Now the next watch to speak about is my Zin 104, and this is of course a piece which is, is now up for sale, but, but before I speak about any of that, it's a watch which I've enjoyed now for, uh, for quite a few months, for, for well over a year and a half now, and it's a piece which has, has been always a fantastic daily wear watch, and surprisingly it's actually remained in very good condition as a result of the fact that it's a modestly sized watch, but also it's a watch which is very, very ergonomic, so unlike something like, for example, my Speedmaster, which is a watch which I don't think I'd ever sell because it's just like an extreme and mad watch to own, this is an extremely subtle watch if you want it to be, but a great pilot's watch if not, with, of course, that, um, that negative pressure resistance which is in use. So if you were, for example, to eject from a cockpit, of course, uh, only certain people would be under those circumstances, but say it were to occur, this watch wouldn't have the crystal blown out, which does occur on some watches as a result of the pressure being higher inside the case than outside, really the opposite to diving. But of course it does still have a 200 meter water resistance, so it's a fantastic all-purpose watch, and if it wasn't for some new additions to my collection, I think it would have been a watch which I would have worn far, far more. Of course one has features like the day-date being in German and English, which is a nice touch too, and the screw-down crown means you have no concerns for water ingress. The water resistance um, is also helpful, bearing in mind the fact there's great loom on this watch too, on the hands and of course on, on the indices. And you can look at my review for a comprehensive look at this 41mm pilot's watch, but you can see in this watch why it's one of Zinn's best sellers. Also the bezel is bi-directional and it's a captive bezel, so it's screwed into place, um, which means that the bezel is, is uh, run on ball bearings um, rather than the non-normal click springs, which means it pops effortlessly from, um, from click to click. And of course it's a countdown bezel too, so that you can, uh, you can time something like boiling an egg for instance, or, or something far more complex, but it works for something as simple as that. And the bezel being aluminium like this uh, is perhaps a more old fashioned approach, but it does mean they're cheaper to replace if they are damaged, which is something which is a, a nice, a nice trade off, and uh, so far I've had no problems with scratching. One feature I've noticed about this watch is the anti-reflective uh, sapphire crystal, which means that you really do have a fantastic range of, of view onto the dial of this watch, which for this price you wouldn't expect. And if you turn the watch over, the movement is the, the, uh, the very well recognised and incredibly widely serviced Slita SW200, but built to Zinn standards, and also it is decorated with that Zinn rotor, as well as, as decoration on the bridges, which I think is very elegant, but also very nicely applied with blued screws. 
And so far, mine's kept to about plus or minus one second a day, which is more than I could ever expect from a watch at this price point. So I think I'll be I'll be sad to, to to let go of this piece, but bearing in mind the mounting cost of having a collection this size, especially with servicing, I really will have to let go of this piece. And so if you're interested, then do drop me an email. The price of this watch is £800 plus postage. Now the next piece to speak about is another model which unfortunately I'll have, I'll have to be parting with, not necessarily due to, um, uh, due to any disliking for the watch, because I think it's still a marvellous watch and one which, if it wasn't for the size of the collection, service prices for the whole collection, I must admit I wouldn't get rid of. Um, this is the Seiko SBDX-017 Marine Master. And Seiko is a manufacturer which is going through a great deal of change at the moment. They're moving towards the luxury realms, as, be, as has been seen in some of their, their newer watches, which do give the trade-off of, um, of a much higher price for admittedly uh, more advanced movements where their, their spring drive movements are concerned. But I think this is the last of a, a, a certain era of Seiko, where this watch was somewhere between an, an absolute tool watch and something which really was produced for a niche, which I think is, is uh, the way of things, really, that Seiko will change, and, um, and I think under, under different direction um, with regards to what they're trying to do with their, their range. It's, un it's, it's unmistakably the case that they are going for higher prices. And so the newer version of this watch, um, as opposed to this being the SPDX-017, which, uh, as opposed to the original Marine Master, had a, uh, a revised escapement inside the watch for more efficiency, as well as, uh, as die shield on the case which coats it and prevents scratches. It's essentially the same as the original. Also, there is the newer version, which is a £3,000 watch, so a, a fair bit more than this piece, but does have the ceramic bezel and that sapphire crystal. But I, I find this watch rather charming with its, its beautiful handmade bezel, which is this wonderful lacquered finish, and I've been able to avoid scratches, but, um, uh, but certainly it is a bezel which is more fragile than ceramic, but does give a higher gloss to it. Also, it uses a hard lex crystal, which I, I also like because it gives this, this distortion, which is quite wonderful in terms of looking a bit more like a, a vintage crystal. But uh, one shouldn't mistake this watch for anything other than modern technology, with this spectacular Zeratsu finishing on the sides, which gives this very, very high polish to the, the side of the case, which you really don't see elsewhere, and of course a screw-down crown with the Prospect's X on it. The bracelet on this watch is a mix of steel and also some titanium in the clasp, and of course has this, um, this uh, rather famous um, setup whereby it's ratcheting, um, so that by pulling this section down you can extend it over a, a wetsuit and then retract it as well. And uh, admittedly on this watch I've, I've never used it on the bracelet. I wore it very briefly um, at home just to try it out, but um, the stickers have all gone back on because I never sized it properly and, and left it at that because I'm not a bracelet sort of person and especially with a watch of this weight it just wasn't my sort of way of wearing it. But it has a wonderful action to the bezel as well and of course the front of the watch is how you get into it because the case back is this solid uh, monoblock form developed in the 70s for, uh, for higher water resistance. And so as a result, uh, the bezel pops off, um, as well as having these um, grips underneath, which are very similar to a normal case back, which unscrew the whole crystal assembly, and through a lever the crown is ejected, and then the whole movement can be removed from the front, which is unique. But the depth on this watch is spectacular, with these exquisite polished and brushed hands which are beveled and sharpened, and even a brushed steel, uh, uh, steel insert um, and, and date wheel, which is quite wonderful, and you would first mistake for white, but is in fact silver. And so with the 8L35 moved in it with a 50-hour power reserve running at 4 hertz, which is uncharacteristic for Seiko with hacking and hand winding, it's a marvellous watch, and I'm asking £1,800 for it, which um, is, is, uh, is a reasonable price in terms of what these are going for. So with an unused um, bracelet, also the strap is in extremely good condition, and of course full box and papers with a European warranty, as opposed to a Japanese one produced in the last few weeks of production last year. So again, do drop me an email if you're interested. Now the next watch is also a Seiko, but it's a watch which is far less serious than the Marine Master, and costing about a tenth of the price. And this is the watch which, met with the, which the most people have approached me to try and purchase from me, but due to the fact that it's not really worth the massive amount of money, and also the fact that this watch is a piece I just get too much enjoyment from, it's not a piece which I would sell. And it's based on the Seiko 5 with its 100 meter water resistance, and its 7S26 movement, which is rudimentary to say the least. Uh, with no hacking or hand winding, and um, just a very efficient, extremely affordable to service movement. And it's not really a dive watch because it does only have 100 metres of water resistance and certainly is no, um, uh, no piece to be used at great depth, but you can still really swim with though without too much concern. But it doesn't have a screw-down crown, as you can see. And the watch itself has a fairly simple 60-click bezel, 
which uh, isn't loomed, uh, but does have this, this acrylic insert, which is quite good fun in terms of giving a very soft, warm light. But it's a very entertaining watch to own because it looks very similar thanks to this dial, which has been replaced from the original, um, like the, the Blancpain 50 Fathoms used by, for example, Jacques Cousteau. And so it's, it's a lovely looking piece with its golden accents, black dial with these, these four sections. And I think on this, uh, this strap, which is water resistant leather, it really does look the part. So it's a watch which I, I enjoy enormously, and certainly it's not a serious watch with its hard lex crystal and fairly basic build, but it's great fun to own. Now this next piece is an important one for me, because it's a model which, uh, from Omega in the form of their Seamaster 300, was the last of the line of this, this watch, as far as the original design went. Now I must say the new version is a fantastic watch, very well built, with a very innovative movement and, and a design which has evolved very nicely. But for me, the version which is closest to my heart is this uh, this 2016 um, version of the 2012 reboot of the model with a ceramic bezel and this uh, this waveless lacquered dial, or rather enameled dial, one should say, as well as this this form which is very very similar to the original one from the 90s, and really is the best balance of both worlds for me. Now this piece has been with me through uh, a lot of interesting moments, and and it's a watch which I've really lived with, and so it's a piece which, whilst uh, just as much a design classic as that Seiko is perhaps a bit closer to my heart in terms of being something which has been very important to me um, over the, the time I've owned it. And certainly the movement inside this watch isn't the most modern, because the 2500 calibre inside this watch, which isn't visible behind that uh, that case back, is based on the ETA uh, 2892, but has the coaxial escapement, and has quite a lot of, uh, of, of, of work done to it to make it a fundamentally different movement, so parts aren't compatible with each other. But even so, the architecture goes back to the 60s, which is quite interesting. But what I like is that it's the movement which brought the coaxial escapement to Omega, and also it's a very, very slim movement, so the whole watch can be very slim, and still retain this 41mm diameter from side to side. And the proportion I've always liked about this watch is that the mid-case, which is to say this brushed area, as you can see, is actually very slim whilst the thickness is in the case back. And this is really the opposite to what one notices in the, the newer version, and really for my wrist this just fits me better. But amongst the features I love, one has that, uh, that glossy dial, the fantastic anti-reflective crystal, which is one of the best I've ever seen. And of course the helium escape valve is complained about by some as being uh, superfluous um, for the vast majority of, of people, but I must say I rather like its presence on the side of the case. And I think in future I will be looking for a much higher water-resistant dive watch, a water-resistance dive watch rather, to, to, to go next to this in the collection as something a bit more. But at the moment this is a wonderful watch to own and one which, uh, which never ceases to, to, to impress me, whether it's the accuracy of the watch, the sheer quality of it, or just the general versatility, which means that you can wear this watch as comfortably with a suit as, as with shorts, making it really a fantastic piece in my collection. Now we come to the first chronograph in this video, and it's a watch which I was looking at for well over a year before buying, and those who watch my channel will know that I'm a great fan of the Omega Speedmaster Mark series. And these were watches produced between 1969 and, and really actually the mid-80s, if you look at some of them, the, the absolute latest models. Because this was a range of Speedmasters which originally, when the Mark II came out, were designed to replace the Professional. And so it had this, this tunnel style of case with polished areas along the sides, but the same movement as the, the original Speedmaster, although the 861 rather than the 321, because they'd already moved on with the normal Speedmaster as well. But this is the Mark III, and it's a piece which has fascinated me for, for as long as I've known about it. And it's a piece which I never thought I'd buy myself, I thought I'd go for the Mark II, in terms of its, say, its dimensions and its, its historical importance. But this watch is one which I think is, is vastly overlooked, and also a watch which is heavily underrated. Now it has this spectacular 41mm case which is nearing 16mm in thickness, but as you can see it feels much larger than it is, because of that, that bizarre shape which on the wrist is, is quite spectacular as you can see. Although you do have to pair it with quite a soft strap, it's actually a very very comfortable watch to wear, which is a surprise really. But what's interesting about this watch is that aside from having this spectacular case which was the most spectacular um, of the Speedmasters, because after this piece with the Mark IV they went to a much more standard case, this piece is, is very much uh, an early 70s exercise in producing the first automatic movement um, from Omega with, with a chronograph. And so this was the first watch um, to have that, though later Seamasters did have it, as well as later versions of the Speedmaster. But the curious thing about this Calibre 1040 is that, aside from being based um, on, a, uh, on in fact a 1340 Calibre from Lamania, um, apart from the fact the Omega specific one has a different finish on the movement, more jewels at 22 in this watch, and also has this 24-hour uh, indicator underneath the seconds on this side, it's the same movement. 
One other elegant uh, aspect is that when you start the chronograph, the, the seconds are of course central, but also the minutes. So that other hand shows you the minutes of the chronograph with 60 minutes being counted, which actually is a, a much, more, uh, much more helpful way of reading the time and much quicker. And so I love this watch for the fact that it was apparently used in space, although nothing has been, um, been confirmed as it's been seen on the wrists of several Soviet astronauts during the period, which is an interesting fact about this watch. So it doesn't have that NASA connection, but it does have that, um, uh, that Soviet side, which is different for a Speedmaster and I find very interesting. But also the fact that this watch was, uh, was a watch which really was too expensive for Omega to make does put a smile on my face. The fact that this watch just couldn't last, because actually the 1040 was just too expensive to, to make. It was a much more expensive movement to make than the 5100. Le Mania calibre used after this, and really was a piece which, um, which was, was always fated, because it used a lot of, uh, of shared parts with older chronograph movements. And so in my eyes it's really a, a pinnacle of engineering and design, which I, I can't help but love. And of course my case is a, is a tad over-polished, as you can see it has these strange sort of shapes to it, because it has been, um, been reshaped over the years, as well as the crown which has been replaced. However, I've been able to get, get hold of a new old stock case for this watch, as well as a new old stock crown, still in original packaging, um, from Omega, which I think is, is a wonderful aspect to this watch. And of course, if I ever sold it, which I must say I don't think I ever will because it's an important piece to me, um, then uh, I would, of course, say that uh, there is a spare case coming with it. But in time, I think I'll have the, the crown uh, as well as the case replaced with the, the new old stock ones to really make this watch the absolute original. Now, this next piece is a new addition to my collection. And it's a watch which I bought, um, bearing in mind the fact that I'll be, I'll be downsizing the collection and selling a few pieces. I thought really I should consolidate my, um, my funds into a watch which has a great deal of build quality and also from a brand which I know personally, which I think is something which does make buying from a brand, especially at a higher price range, very reassuring. The fact that you know the people who, uh, who work there now and one can be confident of the, the quality and the way they work, which I think is wonderful. And this is a GMT chronograph from Chrono Swiss from 2005. And at 38mm in diameter, it's a smaller piece, but thanks to these screwed lugs, it certainly is very substantial on the wrist. But I think the most spectacular aspect about this watch is the Gyoshi dial, which is absolutely beautiful. And of course, these hands are thermally blued, and the detailing is spectacular. For example, the centre of the hands are raised, whilst the edges and the length of the hands are lowered and also bevelled across their centre to give this curvature, which I really wouldn't expect to see at this price range, nor would I expect to see these hands which curve downwards. And the general finishing is, is superb. Um, th there's really nothing I can criticise about this watch. It's a, a watch which has so many influences coming to it, whether one looks at some pilot's watches and early pieces from the 30s with that crown and that knurling, or the early water-resistant Patek Philippe's um, with that, um, uh, that style of pusher, or the beautiful dial, which is reminiscent to some degree of some Breguet work. It's a, it's a beautiful piece, and I won't give too much away because there will be a full review coming. But it's a piece with that GMT function and that chronograph, as well as the date which goes back and forward, which is just marvellous. Also, the strap from Chrono Swiss is this wonderful alligator, and is extremely well made, very supple, and this chocolate brown is a wonderful uh, wonderful um, addition to this watch. Whilst the movement is based on the Velger 7750, and it is a chronometer-grade version, because one has a different balance on this watch to the standard version, and of course it's decorated with that, that wonderful rotor. And it's a movement which is, is very well known, uh, well respected, but also not too expensive to service, which is a nice, uh, nice balance of the fact that you know this movement won't go wrong in terms of, of being incredibly reliable. But also it's just a marvellously marvelously engineered movement, which when decorated and presented in this form, is a fantastic, uh, fantastic companion on the wrist. So I look forward to wearing this watch more and then producing a full, uh, full video about it. Now moving to this side of the, of the collection, one sees a number of dress watches, and of course the first to speak about is my 36mm Ladies Tissot. And this piece was given to me by my father and so has a great deal of sentimental value to it. But in terms of its build, it's a watch which is, in my eyes, very beautifully designed, and it is a Marmite watch because some like it and some don't, but I must say it's a piece which appeals to me because it has like, this wonderful uh, enamel dial with these applied numerals, um, as well as this, this, this interesting uh, exhibition open heart, so that you can see the movement through it. Of course, this is helped by the fact that the ETA 2824 has a, a top-mounted balance, so it's able to be in quite a nice position. But the movement is quite lovely to look at from the back as well, and bearing in mind this watch isn't a particularly expensive piece, the movement isn't decorated, but I think the, the gold tone to it, as well as the golden rotor, is, uh, is, is very appealing and does fit the watch very well. And naturally, it is much more of a dress watch than anything else, but it's a wonderful piece, and one which I don't think I'd ever part with, because of its, its value to me in terms of the sentimental value of this watch. 
But it's a well-built piece, and I think it does show when, that when Tissot get it right, they really can get it very, very right, which I think is, is quite fantastic. And so this is very different, though, to my other dress watches, because here we have two pieces which, in fact, are very similar in terms of their aesthetics. The first, of course, being this uh, Longines Conquest in this, this heritage form. And this piece is, uh, if, I, if I just move that bit of fluff, is a 35mm watch, which did come in a slightly larger size as well. But you notice it actually looks much larger due to its large dial than the Tissot, despite the fact that it is actually a millimetre narrower. With its fully polished case, though, and, and its dome plexiglass crystal, I think it's a wonderful piece to look at, and, and extremely well detailed, as really are all of the, the Longines Heritage models. One sees that the hands are beveled down the centre in this Dauphine style, and it has these markers which are moved inboard of the edges of the dial, rather than having them running around the, the very rim of the dial. And there's a small amount of loom on this watch, but nothing really to be of help in the dark. And I feel the applied uh, indices are wonderful, with uh, their facets cut and polished beautifully, and the date placed at 12. There is, of course, a signed crown, and the case back has this interesting medallion, which is very similar to the original medallions seen on these watches, um, because this is an almost perfect recreation of their pieces um, from the mid-century. And I think that very few brands can go that close to the original, bearing in mind this is the same size as well. And of course that had a very different movement to this piece now, but I think the choice of an ETA2824 was, was almost um, uh, almost impossible to avoid, bearing in mind the price range of this and the fact that they are a Swatch-owned brand. But it's a wonderful watch, and one which is very enjoyable to wear without the concerns of a vintage piece. But then of course there is another watch in the collection which, uh, which plays to a very similar sort of um, appeal, and this is my Universal Genève. And this piece is actually from 1959, but it really is in marvellous condition. It's manually wound and, and has a, a few features which are, I find wonderful that it still keeps good time. And the fact that the movement has been, uh, been serviced and maintained, it's extremely clean as well, which is most important. And as you notice, it has this domed plexiglass crystal and is fantastically slim. Now, originally it came on this beautiful, um, a beautiful style of hexagonal link bracelet. And that I still have in very good condition, but I do worry about wearing it on that bracelet due to its, its fragility. Instead, I now wear it on this, this rather attractive um, ostrich, uh, ostrich skin strap, which I think fits it perfectly. And of course, this is a watch with nothing on the case back of particular interest, but it has an in-house manually wound movement from Universal Genève at the time. And these watches are, are not necessarily particularly collectible because the pole routers get all of the attention because of their micro rotor movements. But I think it's still a wonderful piece to behold, a wonderful piece to own, and also still having the original crown, which, which can be seen um, there, which can be seen with the, the U on it, and the fact that the dial has an applied logo, um, and the fact that it's just in such good condition, is quite wonderful to behold. And it's a piece which I, I come back to as a, a watch which always grounds me in what's really important for a watch, which is quality, but also interesting detail. And there's very little detail on this watch anyway, but the print is wonderful, the quality of the hands is wonderful, even the quality of the movement is superb, and so it really is a pleasure to own and, and to enjoy. Now the next watch to speak about is this Beaumarcier, and in fact it's the last watch in the collection. And it's a piece with a very interesting history, but also beautiful condition for this particular example. Now this piece is from the early 70s, and the case has been worn down over the years, though it doesn't appear to have been polished, because it would have had brushed elements on the top of the lugs, but it appears these have worn away to a large degree, they're still just visible. But uh, this does seem to be just general wear which has worn them away, rather than, um, than any, any sort of polishing, which is nice to see because one does see an incredibly crisp bezel where it's protected by the, the crystal to a certain degree. And it really is a wonderful piece to behold, and still has maintained most of its shape over the years, giving it this, this wonderful glow in 18 karat gold. And it's a piece which is wonderful uh, in terms of its design, in terms of its aesthetics, and gives you an interesting sort of play on that Rolex Datejust look, although this is in many ways a far more complex movement historically um, inside this watch than the ones you would find in Datejusts of the period. Now this piece doesn't have a quick set date, instead you have to wind it past 12 o'clock um, several times to get it to the correct date, which is a, a certain frustration, but the condition of this watch is spectacular. The dial with its sunburst champagne colour is perfectly maintained whilst the hands haven't corroded, and the date wheel you can see matches the dial. One also has an internal cyclops inside that plexiglass crystal to give you magnification whilst, uh, whilst preventing there being any sort of bump on the outside, which is a wonderful touch. One also has a matching solid gold crown, but it's the movement inside this watch behind this, um, this closed case back, which is very interesting. Because the movement inside this is the, the Buren 1280, 
which was on one of the very early movements to have a micro-rotor automatic uh, winding set up. And so this means that there's a rotor which, rather than being large across the whole size of the movement, is smaller and sits on the one side whilst rotating. And this means you can have a, a much slimmer movement, but also a, a more refined one in this way, and was very much contemporary of those universal automatics with this, um, the, this, this micro-rotor technology. But interestingly, when the beat rate of this watch was increased from 19,800 vibrations per hour to 21,600, it was put into the, uh, the calibre 11 and 12 used by Hoyer um, in their, their famous early chronographs with automatic winding. And so uh, this was done through changes to the gear train to be able to allow the hands to still move at the same speed, despite the higher beat rate. But uh, even so, this shares a lot of parts. There's a, a wonderful piece to see historically, and whilst these aren't easily serviced or maintained, they're wonderful movements to, to have as far as a, uh, an interesting glimpse into history. And so that concludes my 2019 collection review, speaking about the various watches I have and, uh, and the various progresses uh, within the collection in terms of changing things and, and enjoying certain other aspects. And I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you enjoyed it, then do like, share and subscribe to help the channel and also to be able to see more videos and content here in future. So thank you very much for watching. This is Arm on the Watch Guy, out.